What if I told you that the same type of yeast used to make beer could one day save the life of someone you love? That it can make new drugs all by itself if only we stop to look at what it's doing? Join me and explore how we can harness the power of biodiversity to not only make great beer, but to improve healthcare. And we'll look at this through genetics, which, as we've learned today, means small changes can make a big difference. My journey started with a fantastic voyage. It was a comic book retelling of this story, and to my young self, it seemed like an incredible way to solve medical issues. If only we could control something that small. When I learned about nanotechnology some years later, I knew what I had to do. I packed my bags and I went to Clemson. During my junior year, I decided that I could take on another class. So I picked up a course catalog, looking for a good balance between an interesting subject, but not too much work. And what I found was the holy grail of college courses. I discovered a class called the Science of Beer. As you can imagine, I signed up as soon as I could. And one of the projects we completed in this class was that we took yeast from a bottle of beer, grew it up, and we used it to make more beer. We were all amazed at our brilliance and what this science could do for us. <laughs> But we started to ask some questions too. Can we use this method to grow other kinds of yeast? And can we find some yeast that nobody has brewed with before? So we launched a pilot project at a、uh, nearby research farm, and spent a sunny June afternoon collecting yeast from flowers, fruits, and berries. And what we discovered was that there was a huge difference between the yeast strains, even from this small area. Flavor profiles, mouth feels, how quickly they finished, everything was different, and an idea was beginning to ferment. But <laughs> well, let's take a step back and look at what yeast is for a minute. Yeast is a single-celled fungus that eats sugar to survive. When it does this without oxygen around, it uses a process called fermentation, and this is how all of your favorite adult beverages are made. The way my business partner likes to put it is that yeast eats sugar, sweats out alcohol, and farts carbon dioxide. <laughs> Which was an easy concept for us undergraduates to grasp. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't go much deeper into organic chemistry today. But know that to a yeast, not all sugars are made the same, and the yeast's ability to eat these different sugars is written in its genes. Certain enzymes allow the yeast to eat some sugars, but not all of them, and the yeast will adapt what enzymes it produces. Through generations of growing on a certain fruit, flower, whatever. So that, what that means is that a yeast that we find on a peach will eat very different sugars in a very different way than one we find on in a beehive, for example. But the yeast's genetics determine a lot more than just what it can eat. It determines how fast it reproduces. How well it tolerates changing temperatures, and above all, for my company, it determines what it's going to make your beer taste like. As the yeast ferments the sugar into alcohol, side reactions produce compounds called esters and phenols. And if you remember your high school chemistry, you may recognize these as smell and taste molecules. If you don't, here's your homework for tonight: go drink a Belgian ale. The fruity flavors come from esters. And the spice notes are phenols. If you're a wine enthusiast, you may be more familiar with the term terroir, which means the flavor of the region. Where the basic idea is that if I had two buckets, one, two buckets of grapes, one from California and one from Canada, you would expect them and their products to taste different based on the different climates they were grown in. But it's a little more difficult to imagine what those climate differences mean for the yeast that grows on the grape. The warm weather yeast may be more used to high temperatures; it may ferment faster. 
while the Canadian yeast maybe didn't have as much sugar available to it growing up. So it had to get really good at changing its metabolism to eat a lot of different sugars, making a much drier product in the end. And it's these differences that make it so exciting when we go out bioprospecting, because we never know exactly what we're going to find in each different location. But what does all of that mean for your pint? Take a look at this picture. How many different kinds of yeast do you see here? The 10 sludges are pretty difficult to tell apart without a microscope. So let me help you out. How many different beers do you see in this picture? If you thought it was a trick question, you're right. This is all the exact same batch of beer. All we did was put five different yeasts in it. Doing something as simple as changing the yeast makes a big difference in what we can see, smell, and taste. But now that we've covered all of the important topics, let's get back to medicine. The, I, hope, <laughs> I hope you'll agree with me that making changes in the genetics have a significant impact on how these organisms function. And even though it's easiest to see in flavors in beer, the same types of reactions that produce these esters and phenols can also produce other compounds, like the polyphenols you heard about earlier today, that have health benefits, can even act as drugs. And while medical beer may sound far-fetched, it wouldn't be the first time a fungus came out of nowhere to change the face of medical science. You may have heard of a drug called penicillin, which Alexander Fleming discovered in a bacterial culture that got infected with mold. And he took what was basically trash, and turned it into something that has saved millions of lives to date. So if yeast is not just yeast, but different, based on where it came from and what it came from, what else have we looked at one time, from one place, one substrate, and assumed we knew everything about? We live on a planet that is teeming with life, waiting to be explored. And with that in mind, I want you to ask yourself, could a cure to cancer be living in your backyard? Thank you.